in the ministry, I almost always had a job. In addition to the church. For example, In 1969, I went to Bradford County as the executive director of Children and Youth. In about a week or two, one of the county commissioners, who was my boss, came to me and said, I go to a little church called, I forget the name of it, it was basically a Wesleyan church. But he said, we have another church in a little town called North Rome, and they need a pastor. And I told them that I would talk to you and see if you would go and preach for them. That became one of the most beautiful time periods in my life. I got the biggest kick out of seeing the empty church five minutes before it was time to start the service. Then all of a sudden, a whole pile of cards would come in. These were the farmers that belonged to that church. And I could tell you what they were doing before they came to the church. They carried stuff on their shoes, <laughs> couldn't get it quite off in time to come to the service. They're beautiful people. Had a gentleman who moved from New Jersey. He was a symphony level violin player and bass guitar player. His wife was an incredible pianist. In that church, we pulled together a couple of cornet players, one gentleman always brought his guitar, and then he had a harmonica attached to it, and he was good. He was really good. We had fun with them. Had a young man and his wife who played trumpets. And so we had a significant combination of people. We left the door open on Wednesday nights, and we had a good time together. But on one Wednesday night, we were having a good time with our band. There are about 12 of us. Of course, we were always accompanied by an incredible organ player. Not as good as our man. <laughs> but she was, she was good. And they were from Brooklyn. But they had moved into the hills of Pennsylvania, <coughs> farmland, because they wanted a change in lifestyle. He became the principal of the school system, they made a great contribution to that area. Before I left that church, we had organized a public school as part of our church. But what I'm trying to get at is that there's a different way of looking at life, depending on who you are and where you are and what you're doing. I wasn't on my job very long before I came back from an assignment that I gave myself, walked into my office, Barb Yanofsky was my private secretary, and she was waiting for me. And she said, Bill, you've got to do something about Mary Jean. I said, well, what do you want me to do for Mary Jean? 
Well, she was the other secretary. Mostly she just typed up records. But she said, go into her office and she'll tell you what's wrong with her. And so I did. <coughs> she spilled out a nasty accusation about my friend, the commissioner, who was also my boss. I talked to her and I said, Mary Jean, what happened? Well, she told me what happened. My friend, the commissioner, would come into her office just to mess with her just to mess with her, physically and sexually. And so I talked to her and I said, Mary Jean, this gentleman is my boss and he's your boss. Are you asking me to do something? And she said, yes, I'm asking you to do something. And I said, I'm a coward. I'm scared, but I will pray. I will pray for me. And I asked the Lord to help me. I said, God, I can't handle this kind of stuff. This is my boss. I didn't really hear God speak, but I could hear feel it in my heart that this, if this were my child, I would sure go talk to that commissioner and tell him to keep his hands off of her. But I prayed and I knew that God was moving me. And so a couple of nights later, I was working late again. And I went out to the parking lot to do a few things with my car. And as I looked around, guess who was coming out of the courthouse late at night? It was my friend, the commissioner. He came right down to the parking lot and I got myself screwed to the wall, a sticking point, and I said, Harold, I got to talk to you. That was nasty. That was nasty. But it was the hardest part of the whole night. So Harold came over, and just the very second I said to him, Harold, I was just talking to Mary Jean. His head dropped like a guillotine that hit him. I knew that the Lord had cornered him. I mean, he was a Christian. And I brought that subject up, talked a little bit about our witness. And I implied to him that he should apologize and he should promise at least me that he would never do that again. By the time I got finished talking, I was comfortable. I felt good about myself and basically I felt good about Harold. Harold had to stop that kind of stuff. But I caught on to the fact that there's a different world wherever you work. If you go on and work with the state, you're in a different environment. So that was my next step. State offered me a scholarship at Marywood, which I took advantage of. And so I started coming over to Scranton to go to Marywood. Completed my master's program in social work. And I was given the job 
at the state level of inspecting agencies that had anything to do with children. That opened my eyes even more to the kinds of things that happen at different places. All of a sudden, I was auditing monies that came from the federal government and the state government to the county governments for the care of children. I was startled at how much money it was. It was astounding. But you know something we could never figure out? What happened to the money once it landed at the county office? That is still a problem in my mind. Sandy's husband has a sister who is a state senator. I talked to her about it, and mostly she just shook her head, and she said something like this, you can't do anything about that. I would just love to get my teeth into that problem. I know it is still massive statewide. Incidentally, we have 68 counties, and that's how many agencies there are just for children. And Sandy, when's the last time you got a pay raise? Last year, I got one finally after a four-year freeze. It's not easy, is it? No. I still believe that the children and youth staff is the poorest paid group on every county agency. You learn a lot from where you work about what is going on. Jesus knew about a judge who was a rascal. When it says that he waited a while before he decided to do something about this widow who came to see him. And it's the same language that is used in other places in Scripture. where legal representatives waited to get paid off. At the state level, I had a couple problems. I won't burden, burden you with them. But I did have to go through a couple experiences where I knew there were young women being sexually abused regularly by their own father. And I did my best to run that complaint through the main office over in Bradford County. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. I got suspicious about it, but sure enough, the judge came to me. The judge came to me and said, Bill, I got to talk to you. Well, I figured this was going to be it. It was it. He said, Mr. So-and-so is a good citizen. I said, oh boy, here it comes. He's the president of the Rotary Club. He's a leader in our community. And he said, I had a good talk to him, and he promised me that he wouldn't do that again. My face fell to the floor. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But he dismissed the case. Those two women never looked at me again. And I don't blame them. 
That was nasty. That was terrible. I never would have known that had I not gotten that job. The little rural county has the second largest dairy produ production uh, county in the state of Pennsylvania. And so I was learning what happens in a rural area. There were a couple more events, not quite as nasty as that. But it was a privilege that was mine because I was a state employee and I was getting to look at things intimately. This situation that we're looking at today, Jesus picked up on a judge who had no fear of God and no respect for mankind. And he started this whole thing by saying that men, I'm sure he also meant women, always ought to pray and not lose heart. I believe that he was saying, if you're a man in this world and you see what's going on, you better be praying or you could crash. You could get into terrible trouble. Things just won't work out right for you. That's kind of included in this language that Jesus used. Now there was a widow in that city and she came to him saying, get justice for me from my adversary. We don't know what the adversary was and we don't know what the justice was that she was looking for. And he would not for a while. That's the same phrase that's used in other sections of scripture where people were being paid off to speak to Paul, for example, in 1 Thessalonians. Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her lest by her continual coming she wearies me. I mean, that's a pretty grubby excuse for putting the dear soul off, wasn't it? She was going to irritate me. She's going to take up my time. She's going to keep me away from the ball game. And the Lord said, hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? That's not a real upbeat statement that Jesus makes about how he sees us guys, us men. There are discrepancies all around us. There are problems coming over the news day and night. Are you praying? Are you praying? The way Jesus puts it, men always ought to pray because if you don't, you're going to lose heart. You're going to lose your enthusiasm about putting your stamp on the world for Christ. Jesus has this thing down to a fine formula. 
if you're a man and you're alive and you're alert, you better be praying. As I was reading this over on my own behalf throughout the course of the week, it occurred to me that I don't stop often enough to present problems to the Lord. I say short ones in the morning. Thank you, God, for healing my bad knee, my bad ankles, my bad feet, my bad hip, my bad heart. I mean, it goes on and on. But there are people worldwide who are suffering that I should be praying about. And so should you. We all need to be praying men. Incidentally, I just see that as a reference to humanity. Humanity. Men and women. We all need to pray. <coughs> Specifically for our church. For our community. For people everywhere that we meet. We need to pray that God will come to the rescue of us all. You know that I'm not going to do political speeches from the pulpit. I know better than that. But do pray to be obedient to what Jesus is saying to all of us, right here in chapter 18. Then he spoke a parable to them that men and women always ought to pray. Otherwise, you're going to lose heart. And you need to have your heart functioning properly to interpret your place in this world. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's the sermon for today.